All right, there's, uh, there's no singing this evening to uh, let you know that we're about to start. I do have two songs picked out, but I'm not going to lead them, uh, lead you in singing them. You're just going to be thinking about them while we're looking at pictures tonight. Uh, the two songs, of course, are Deep and Wide and <laughs> Like a River Glorious. So uh, let me pray and we'll start our time. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this evening. Uh, we thank you for the beautiful things that you have made. Uh, we thank you for the evidence all around us of your glory. In fact, all creation shouts your glory. It's a remarkable thing to live here in the desert Southwest and, and see a giant floodplain and the evidences of all that you did in destructive judgment in a worldwide flood. Uh, we pray that as we think about the rocks uh, in our own state, as we think about uh, how they were formed, uh, what they mean, that you would be honored, you'd be glorified um, by the testimony of what you have done. And uh, we pray that your word would reign supreme in our hearts, uh, that we would be those who herald your mercy at rescuing people from the flood uh, and the warning of coming judgment for all those who don't find rescue in Christ. So we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, this evening uh, is just a little bit different. Not a sermon. Uh, this is movie night, uh, picture night. I had a really remarkable opportunity this last summer uh, to be in the Grand Canyon. And as a church, we took something of a field trip. And, and you remember, we got a couple layers down to the Coconino sandstone on a, on a hike together. And we got to see some of the evidences of a global flood and, uh, and then the carving out of layers in catastrophic fashion. We got to see some of those things. And we got to view the canyon from the rim, from the south rim. Uh, and that was uh, just a, a wonderful experience. I did not know at that time that I would be at the bottom of the Grand Canyon just a short time later. And I got a last minute invitation to be a part of a Christian leader's trip down the Grand Canyon. Uh, it was an eight day trip. And uh, got to spend time with some really remarkable men and see some amazing things. Caveat up front, I am not a geologist. I just got to hang out with geologists all week in a boat. And so I'm going to try my best to tell you what I learned. Uh, this is not strictly a geology lecture. I, would, I have no credentials for that kind of thing. I'm only going to try to parrot what was told me uh, while I boated down the Grand Canyon with my lower jaw at the bottom of the boat, just a gape. So um, I have more pictures and stories than we have time for this evening. I've tried to boil down some highlights to five significant lessons that I could share with you this evening. Um, but if you want more pictures, more stories, um, you'll have to come over to my house and be bored with the old school slideshow. Do you remember going over to people's house and they said, I want to tell you about my vacation. They got the 35 millimeter slides out and they went click, click. And you were asleep after like the seventh picture. You can come over to my house and we'll sort of reenact that kind of thing. I'll try to condense and summarize some exciting things for you this evening. So lessons from the Grand Canyon, something of a book report of the book of my trip. And uh, I got to be there with those guys. It didn't work. Oh, the next one. It worked. All right. Uh, that is uh, Dr. William Barrick, Dr. Terry Mortensen, Dr. Andrew Snelling, and Dr. John Whitmore. Uh, Dr. Whitmore is a geology professor at Cedarville University. He knows everything about rocks. You can ask him anything about anything else, and he seems to know everything about everything else, too. He's just one of those really, really smart guys. Um, and then, uh, and he's on the, on the right on the picture there. That's Dr. Whitmore. And then you have Terry Mortensen. Uh, Dr. Terry Mortensen uh, is, uh, has a PhD, I believe, in the history and philosophy of origins studies. So he has studied all those who have studied origins for the past few hundred years and, uh, and has written extensively about that. So he kind of knows what everybody thinks about the age of the earth. Um, and then next to him, you have Dr. William Barrick. And uh, Dr. Barrick was my Hebrew professor in seminary. He is a world-class Old Testament scholar uh, and uh, just delightful to be on the trip with him. And then uh, next to Dr. Barrick on the left on the screen is Dr. Andrew Snelling. And Dr. Andrew Snelling uh, was a petroleum ge geologist in Australia and uh, has been working in creation sciences for a long time. 
Uh, he is all these men uh, take the Bible as real literal history and they all know what they're talking about in the world of geology. And it was so amazing to be with these men. And we had 30 plus hours of geology and uh, old Testament lectures from these men that was just worth their weight in gold. Um, and then these men would have their shirts off in a waterfall and be answering questions about rocks around you. And it was just really down to earth, humble guys, uh, but that knew everything in the fields they were talking about. And these men have counted the cost of what it means to embrace the foolishness of believing the Bible at face value. And so just to have a week with them and data dump and just glean everything we could. I know these guys had to get tired of us asking, so is that red wall limestone or is that Muav limestone? I can't remember. And we were supposed to memorize all the layers. We all had homework. We had assignments. We had books we were supposed to read, articles we were supposed to get through. We were supposed to know this stuff before we got into the canyon so we didn't ask them stupid questions. And we still asked them stupid questions. And they were so gracious. Um, the design of this trip um, was to encourage um, pastors, seminary professors, uh, Christian college presidents to come to the Grand Canyon right here in our own state and see the, the evidence right there in front of you about what God did in the global flood. Because the Grand Canyon screams out realities that secular geology does not have answers for. And so they love to invite people who are, I'm not sure what I think about this. Do I believe the, the scientific consensus of the world or do I, leave, do I believe my Bible? Well, come to the Grand Canyon and we're just going to demonstrate to you that you can believe your Bible. Uh, just a really remarkable thing. So uh, we also had four river guides. Uh, these were the uh, burly men driving the boat and cooking all of our food and uh, taking care of us for the week. And then uh, this is the pile of men that went on the trip. Uh, there were men from Brazil, from Quebec, um, from Malaysia, from all over the United States, a couple of Arizona people, um, maybe a familiar face for some of you. That's Clay Miller, pastor at Santan Bible Church. He and I went to seminary together. I did not know he was going to be on the trip and we just got to hang out for a week. That was really remarkable. And then uh, you should recognize this face, um, the, not the one on the left, but the one on the right is a rainbow trout. Uh, from, no, no, the one on the left is Massimo Malica. He's our missionary in Italy. I knew Massimo was going on the trip. He got a spot on this trip over a year ago. I, I have had a desire to be on this trip for a long time. Massimo got in. I couldn't believe it. I was fighting envy in my heart. And I knew I was going to go pick up Massimo from the airport, uh, take him to his hotel, hand him my fishing pole, and try not to cry out of envy. And two weeks before the trip, there was a cancellation. Uh, Dr. Mortensen called me and said, hey, I need to know today, do you want in? And so Janet said I could go. And uh, the timing worked out well. And I called Massimo to make sure he wasn't the one that canceled. And then I got to say, hey, Moss, I'm in your boat. And so Massimo and I got to hang out for a week too. So that was just extra special. Uh, we drove up to Marble Canyon up by Lee's Ferry. That's looking down on the Colorado River from uh, Navajo Bridge. And uh, it's hard to get the scale of the canyon. That looks like a creek, right? But um, I can't remember how high that is off the water. It's very, very high. And uh, we'll, we'll see some more pictures from below the bridge. But uh, the, the place is just a place of staggering beauty and unbelievable scale. I'm going to walk through a couple of just random pictures, just kind of beauty of the canyon and uh, pictures I didn't know where else to put at the front end, and then we'll walk into five lessons. This is a, from end to end, top to bottom. This is a petrified log. Uh, so we would stop at various places along the river, just get out and look at geological things. Um, this tree turned to stone didn't grow here. Uh, and if you've been to petrified forest uh, in the northern part of the state, um, that's probably a misnomer. Uh, there wasn't a forest there. Uh, those logs were all sheared off. Uh, there's no root ball and there's no bark on any of these things. They were all catastrophically removed from the forest where they were transported by water and then buried rapidly in order to be petrified, turned to rock. So it keeps the, the colors of the, of the grains and the lines of the grains of the original wood, but it's all rock now. And so um, there wasn't a forest here, but this great, big, huge, ancient tree was sheared off from somewhere, transported by water 
deposited here, buried rapidly and turned to stone. Uh, and these things are just lying around out there. Uh, scenic views of the canyon. Uh, it's just different from the bottom. Uh, if, if you've ever had anybody have the chance to either hike a rim to rim or maybe go down to Phantom Ranch. Okay, a few of you have done that. Yeah, just different views. I think you could spend your lifetime in the Grand Canyon and not exhaust its beauty. Uh, there's a bighorn sheep. We saw animals. Um, we did a lot of hiking. We went up a lot of side canyons and saw different things. We dug fossils in a lot of these canyons. Not dug fossils, just found them on the ground. Um, everywhere we went, different kinds of scenery. Lots of very narrow canyons to walk through, side washes and slot canyons. Uh, we hiked to waterfalls. And uh, just some really pretty places. These little green oases in the middle of the desert, off in these little canyons. Uh, there's our four PhDs in a waterfall. Uh, I'm standing in a waterfall. Uh, there's another one of our friends, a rainbow trout. And then uh, here's a really ugly fish. That's a chub uh, native to the Colorado River. Um, slimy, ugly. And uh, we threw all the fish back. We didn't want to make our chefs cook for us. But uh, if it were only a fishing trip, it was wildly successful. There were just a lot of places to just throw in a line uh, for a quick second and find a beautiful rainbow trout and a couple ugly chub. It was typical for us to just have a spot on the beach and camp. Uh, we didn't have tents. We just had cots looking up at the stars. Uh, it was pretty warm uh, the week that we went. Um, so you didn't need much. Uh, there weren't bugs. Um, we just kind of slept out in the open. Uh, we would form a, a circle of chairs uh, where we'd sit around, we'd get geology lectures or lectures from the Old Testament. All the men would hear from the PhDs and get to ask questions after the lectures. And we're all taking notes and recording with our phones, trying to remember everything that we heard. And I have forgotten most of it already, um, but it was just epic. Uh, this is Dr. Barak. Again, he was my Hebrew professor in seminary. Uh, he spent 20 years translating the Bible and uh, planting churches in Bangladesh before he came to seminary and taught pastors how to be pastors. And then he's spending the sort of last section of his life writing, but he heads up Canyon Ministries. And uh, so for years, he's been doing these Canyon trips, taking people down the Grand Canyon and uh, talking to them about the flood uh, from the biblical narrative and demonstrating the evidence of the flood that's available for us to see right here in Arizona. Uh, we sang hymns in the canyon. That was pretty incredible uh, with uh, professors and pastors from all over the country, all over the world, uh, singing songs to the glory of God uh, and our voices echoing off the canyon walls. It's pretty special. Um, we did have to bathe. So we did that. We ate like kings. I won't show you all the foodie pictures, but, um, but we did not starve. Uh, it was just, I can't believe how they got all the stuff on the boats to provide us inch and a half thick pork chops and ribeye steaks. And this was fajita night. In fact, four days into this trip, I was still having ice cubes in my Coke with dinner. I don't know how they did that. We we're on rafts the whole time. I saw some really neat things. This is a, a red wall amphitheater. You can kind of see a little cut out in the rock there. That was a place we stopped and we saw some fossils just available there. As we got closer and closer and closer and closer and closer to this giant space, we realized people were playing ultimate Frisbee on the sand in the cave. It's just massive. Again, the scale in Grand Canyon is hard to fathom, but our very large boats are down at the end of that picture and tiny little people in this giant red wall amphitheater cave over the top. Uh, this was Elves Chasm, another little uh, trickly, clear, cool waterfall uh, coming through the canyon, a place to climb and jump into the water. To get everywhere we went, we had to use boats. And the boats go through about 100 plus rapids, and they're rated 1 to 10 on somebody's rapid scale. We went through three level 10 rapids. And most of these rapids are named after people who have died in them. So there's a little bit of anticipation as we went into each of those. You'd hear the roaring water off in the distance. Uh, and, and then you just think, okay, which one is this called? Is this a three? Okay, we can do this. It's a seven. Oh no, we're all going to die. And the, and the boat drivers uh, were, were very good about building up the anticipation. 
they would say, you know, if I miss my cut on this one, the reason it's called Hans Rapid is because Hans was a guy that drowned right there. If I miss my cut, if I, if I don't go in at the correct angle, this giant boat could flip and people have died. Okay, are you going to miss your cut or, or what? Um, but you can see these giant boats just sort of get swallowed up in this big water. And uh, we had a good time doing that. Uh, at the end of the trip, uh, one of the gentlemen on the trip, everybody had to answer some survey questions. One survey question was, what was your favorite rapid? And one of the gentlemen on the trip said, none of them. I hated that part. I'm not here for a whitewater trip. Let's talk about some lessons from the canyon. Uh, what did we learn? I'll give you five this evening. Uh, lesson number one, rivers don't flow uphill. You knew that already, right? You didn't need to go to the Grand Canyon to learn this lesson. I want to show you what I mean. Uh, this is a sort of a panoramic picture from a, a spot called El Tavar. Uh, this is on the south rim, but more upriver uh, towards the north and the east end of the canyon. You can see on the right a three-story stone tower. Uh, that was built by uh, the first famous female architect in the country, but she built a lot of things around the Grand Canyon. And this stone tower looks out over the, over the river, and you can see the river down at the bottom. This was near a spot where Coronado and his explorers uh, told the, the, the native indigenous peoples that they were going to just go down there and get some water. And, uh, and, the, and the, their guides laughed at them and said, uh, no, you're not just going to go down and get some. Yeah, there's a stream down there. It's about six feet wide. Uh, no, it's a mile wide right there. I mean, you, you're standing at the edge of the canyon, and you have no idea how big this thing really is. Uh, it's just impossible to comprehend. But what I want you to notice in this picture, you can kind of see a, a raised elevation area right through the middle of the picture. So that is Paria Plateau on the far side of the canyon, and we're standing on Kaibab Plateau on the near side of the canyon. And all of this is part of the Colorado Plateau, second highest plateau in the world after the Tibetan Plateau. And it is a, an area of geological uplift, likely geologic, violent geological uplift that took place toward the end of the flood itself. And the geological uplift is created by plate tectonics. At the time, it was rapid plate tectonics and plates colliding into one another. And these are the movements that drove up things like the Rocky Mountains. In addition to driving up the Rocky Mountains, it uplifted this entire area. So the Colorado Plateau averages out at 9,000 feet in some areas. And so you get this uplift going on underground that pushes all this massive rock upwards. What's interesting in this picture is the river flows from right to left. It's flowing from the northeast to the southwest. And the, the Colorado River doesn't flow uphill. Like all rivers, it flows downhill. This giant uplift that is this section of the plateau would stop a river. This is why we know the Colorado River did not carve the Grand Canyon. In fact, what we see in this area is fascinating. Here's uh, Massimo and me uh, standing in the same, pot, same spot, and we're listening to Dr. Snelling describe this, uh, this feature, this remarkable spot. And we look out over to the right, sort of upriver, and there's this giant basin. And um, the, the native peoples that live there have oral tradition about a giant inland lake, a giant inland sea that covered a multi-state area. And they have settlements, archaeological settlements around this sea. And they pass on the oral tradition that one day the earth shook. There was a great big sound and our sea disappeared into the ground. That is memory of passed down oral tradition of the people that lived here after the flood. What do we have here in this great big inland sea that would have covered Arizona, Utah, Nevada? Uh, you have a lot of what happened on the, continental, um, uh, on the continent of North America after the flood. You had floodwaters receding off of the continents, scouring the continents and taking sediments uh, to either side, down the Mississippi uh, Delta, um, off, off to the west side, the Great Watershed, which is the um, uh, the Rocky Mountains going sort of either direction, water spreading off the continents, but then water staying in some places where it could not escape. And you have places like the Great Salt Lake, Bonneville Salt Flats, you have the, uh, the Great Lakes themselves. You have lots of areas that are now dry lake beds, especially throughout the desert southwest, 
that were the result of floodwaters that didn't finish receding and have just been evaporating since then. So they get smaller and smaller and smaller. Well, this giant sea was being held back by this uplift uh, at the Perea and the Kaibab Plateau that were sort of an earthen dam stopping up all of this leftover water from the flood. At some point, there is a geological shift and uh, we have a fault line that sort of runs right through the high point of this uplift. And when this fault shifted, earth moved and water had an exit point. And when a lot of water leaves rapidly from some point, it begins to do a lot of hydrological activity, sort of a jackhammer effect onto the rock and earth material underneath it and digs it out and digs it out. And you have this large multi-state body of water evacuating the area quickly and catastrophically. And it is believed carved out the canyon. Now, this is a theory that's held by secular geologists as well as the biblical flood believing young earth geologists that we were with. Um, what we're looking at here from that same spot, sort of zoomed in, you've got a, an area of black rock that's called Cardenas basalt. Uh, the basalt is like um, lava uh, type material. It's uh, inside the, the earth's crust material. Um, and that black line of Cardenas basalt separates sedimentary flood layers. We'll get to that in a minute from creation week, sedimentary flood layers. Um, and, and, I probably just need to reference you to Andrew Snelling's book, Earth's Catastrophic Past. Two volumes, uh, great book, but it describes all of the, the geology related to the, the significant event that was the creation week and the significant event that was the flood, uh, the flood year. Um, but basically, you have sedimentary layers from the creation event because as the, the, the dry land appears out of the water, the water scouring off of that dry land would be grinding up rock and depositing it in other places as sedimentary rock. So you have some creation week sedimentary rock. That's the layers underneath the black Cardenas basalt. But here you can see that the middle section of black has shifted down. It's not in the place that it was. Something moved significantly and this large layer of Cardenas basalt fell down and covered up areas of sedimentary rock that were beneath it or older than it. And it is believed this fault right here and this giant shift of earth is the event that is carried down in oral history by indigenous peoples and is the event that opened the floodgates for this inland sea to drain and carve the Grand Canyon. So the Colorado River never would have flowed uphill, but this earthen dam was broken by a seismic shift. Water spills out and catastrophically carves the canyon. Uh, it's, a, it's a pretty remarkable reconstruction, but just looking at this section from the top, you can actually see, yep, that's uphill. The, the Colorado River can't flow from right to left and carve out this canyon. So that, that was lesson number one, just standing at the top. Uh, lesson number two is water did this. Um, and, and I don't just mean the carving of the canyon, but the laying down the layers that were carved to make the canyon. What are we looking at there? It's kind of dim. Uh, that's Muav limestone and Bright Angel shale, uh, just greens and purple layers. Um, and, and everywhere you look in the canyon, there's just these stratified layers of rock on top of each other. And uh, the clean lines between them indicate that these were laid down, um, you know, in rapid succession on top of one another without erosion in between. Um, some, some significant things we learned um, was uh, John Whitmore is an expert in Coconino sandstone. He's written a dissertation on this, and this is kind of his... Uh, expertise. He wears t-shirts that say, ask me about Coconino sandstone. And you just get him going and he just talks uh, forever about this. But the Coconino sandstone is the layer that if you went on the, the field trip that we took to the South Rim earlier in the summer, that's the layer we hiked down to and then turned back around. And we got to, to, to sit there with the geologist and measure the cross bedding. Do you remember that? Did any of you put a protractor on the wall? 
And what did we discover? That, that wind-borne sand creates sand dunes at a certain angle, and waterborne sand creates sand dunes at another angle, and it's measurable and objective. Uh, additionally, what we learned from John Whitmore was not only to look for the angles of the cross bedding, which is the kind of the layers in sandstone that are made, but also to pay attention to the grains themselves. And he had us take out a magnifying glass and look at the grains and wind borne grains that create sand dunes in dry deserts look a certain way and waterborne grains look a different way. Uh, these are clearly waterborne grains of sand and uh, Dr. Whitmore has a number of technical papers on all the reasons why Coconino sandstone was laid down in water and not by air. But the conventional geological explanation of the Coconino sandstones, uh, a very, very, very thick layer, w which is never reproduced in dry conditions to that thickness. Uh, the conventional geological explanations are woefully inadequate. And he has dozens of reasons why this must be waterborne. Uh, we actually looked at some um, uh, fossils in the, uh, in the Coconino sandstones. And these are really interesting ones. These are fossil footprints. And it has been said that, uh, that vertebrate footprints in Coconino sandstone uh, were created by four-legged animals walking up a dry sand dune in a desert. And then eventually that's solidifying into footprints. And just looking at these footprints here, uh, it's much easier to imagine sort of the, the wet embedding that happens here in the little layers and you see the crinkles. Uh, what's interesting is they, they have in the laboratory put animals in sand, dry sand, wet sand, and then partially submerged sand and just watch, okay, what kind of tracks are made? Where do the claws go? How does the sand layer up against one another? And, and so this kind of thing is one of those evidences that just so clearly demonstrates um, that these animals, by the way, many of which are sort of escaping in the same direction, interestingly enough, and going uphill, interestingly enough, leave these footprints in wet sand underwater that then gets rapidly buried to preserve the footprints. Um, pretty, pretty remarkable evidences. And it's just like, you just... Floating down the canyon, you pull over, you get out and you look, hey, look, there's some fossil footprints. Let's talk about those. Um, this map sort of depicts the, the range in which we find Coconino sandstone. That's one of the other evidences that the, the layers you see in the Grand Canyon, they show up all over the place. And this particular layer, the Coconino sandstone, shows up across a vast multi-state area. In other words, this wasn't just a little desert area of sand dunes that somehow solidified uh, or were swallowed up by a shallow inland sea. This was something totally different. A rapid transmission of sedimentary material over a large area. And then on top of that was piled all these other layers. Uh, throughout the various layers, we found a, a bunch of different marine fossils. Uh, I can't remember what layer of rock this is, but this is a large coral. That coral is uh, probably three times as large as my hand. That was a pretty large fossil. And that was just sitting in a rock in that big amphitheater that we saw. Um, this right here is a nautiloid fossil. Uh, nautiloid is a multi-chambered shell. I don't know if it shows up that well in the picture. You kind of see the outline, but you, if you look close, you can see the multi-chambers in there that the nautiloid would use to go up and down, kind of like a submarine, put water in, pressurize, uh, be able to rise and fall in the water. And what's interesting is these nautiloid fossils happen in the same layer across that multi-state area. And the nautiloids themselves are all pointing the same direction. They're kind of a conical shaped shell. And uh, the, what's been demonstrated in the lab is these would go the same, point the same direction um, in concurrence with a current that is flowing. So what you have is a, a massive sheet of water dropping sediment, burying all these nautiloids, all swimming in the same direction and burying them. And then there's another layer of nautiloids that look like they sort of got tumbled and they're all in jumbled fashion on top of that. So uh, another, just lots of remarkable evidences. These are corals and uh, crinoid fossils. Um, here's a large uh, kind of branch of coral. Um, some I think shells and more crinoids. Uh, that's kind of like a, a fern type uh, coral, uh, marine coral. 
So throughout the layers, you see evidences that rapid burial of marine environments uh, happened. And, and by the way, the only way you make fossils, we've learned this already, the only way you make fossils is by uh, rapid burial, the evacuation of the kinds of things that would deteriorate organic material, and then pressure, which means layers and layers and layers and layers and layers. Normally when something dies, it rots or gets scavenged in order to create a fossil. Uh, you have to bury something, remove all the deterioration factors, and, um, and bury it deeply. All right, lesson number three, 450 million years don't exist. 450 million years don't exist. If you're used to thinking about the Grand Canyon or geological formations uh, or layers and layers of rocks or the, the rocks all around us here in this valley uh, in terms of millions and millions of years, uh, that's sort of what we all grow up with in school. It's what we learn. It just becomes part of the nomenclature. I want to subtract 450 million years from the geological column. I'm not going to subtract it. It was never there. But with a couple of simple photographs, we can demonstrate that there's some uh, missing time. Do you notice anything about these layers of rocks? What do you see? Yeah, they're folded. I th John, I thought you were going to talk about the chemical makeup of the rock from a distance. I was going to be really impressed. Yeah, they're, they're folded. They're bent. And what's critical to, to think about bent rocks, there, there's a couple of mechanisms that can bend rocks. Um, if you put down a bunch of layers of sedimentary rock, and while it is still wet, you have some sort of massive seismic geological pressure force a uh, shift, a fault, or something like that, um, you can bend the layers while they're still wet. Um, you can also bend rock. It has been uh, likely demonstrated that you can bend rock with metamorphic processes. In other words, heat and pressure and temperature, uh, but the metamorphic bending of rocks changes the rocks at the molecular, not at the molecular level, but at the microscopic level. It changes their makeup. Uh, if, if you remember from um, your, your original earth science classes, uh, you have metamorphic rocks, you have sedimentary rocks. Metamorphic rocks are rocks that are changed in their composition. Uh, different elements even come out uh, because of pressure and temperature applied. These are sedimentary rocks that have been bent. And if you've ever tried to take a, a piece of the, the slate tile out in the foyer here and, and just gently bend it, you know, curve it, maybe put an S bend in it or a, a U bend. What does it do? It just breaks because it's brittle. Uh, if you go up to hole in the rock, anybody ever hike hole in the rock over there in North Tempe? Um, all of that sandstone that is there. Um, what would happen if you tried to bend layers of that? It would simply break and fall apart. Uh, once it's solidified, it is totally brittle. These are layers and layers and layers. In fact, in some of these places, 3,000 feet of layers that have bends and waves in them from top to bottom. Uh, this is a really remarkable feature, and we saw this in quite a few places in the Grand Canyon. Uh, there's a pretty violent bend. I hope you can get sort of the scale of these things. These are multi-story high blocks of very heavy rock that have just been sort of folded up. It's pretty dramatic. This is Dr. Andrew Snelling um, standing, he's standing on the boat in the foreground, and in the background is this uh, giant sort of S-bend of Top Heat's sandstone. Now, Top Heat's sandstone is at the bottom layer of flood sedimentary layers. So layers of rock laid down by the flood, the top east sandstone is at the bottom of those, right near the great unconformity. We'll talk about that in a moment. And here, uh, Dr. Snelling is standing in front of it, and he's explaining to us how these rocks got bent and folded up. And the conventional geology dates these rocks at 500 million years old. That's half a billion. Uh, the conventional geology says these rocks were put down 500 million years ago. And conventional geology says the seismic activity that folded the rocks happened 50 million years ago. 
They date the fault line, the, the violent geological activity that folded these sandstones at 50 million years. That's a 450 million year difference. In other words, the, the seismic shift that folded these rocks happened 450 million years after they were laid down. Uh, those rocks are rockified. <laughs> They're dried out. They're not wet. They're not wet layers anymore. They're not pliable. And so what Dr. Snelling has done is he has sampled these rocks personally. He's taken, I don't know, over a hundred river trips down, down the Grand Canyon and done real scientific work. They, they have taken the, the rock samples from these strata, both at the folds and uh, far away from the folds in the same layers and compared them under the microscope and just asked the question, have these rocks been changed by temperature and pressure or do they, have they maintained their um, integrity as sandstone, just like the other layers. And it is so clear, not only from the macro, just seeing this picture, um, but also in the micro, uh, looking through the microscope and looking at the, the structure of the stone itself, uh, thin layers hasn't changed. Still the same. In other words, the only way this could have formed is if the seismic activity that bent these rocks and all the layers 3,000 feet up from these rocks, if it was still all wet. That single picture erases 450 million years from the geologic record. Do you understand why millions of years is a problem in the Grand Canyon? And, and all you have to do is go down to the bottom of it and look and see. Uh, we, we don't have to be browbeaten with the conventional geology. All right, lesson number four. Uh, something is wrong with your dating methods, right? I kiss dating goodbye. No, not that kind of dating. I mean, how we date rocks, how we decide how old or how young rocks are. What is this a picture of? Okay, this is a picture of lava, uh, sort of the, the dark on the left is, is lava flow. It's cooled. And it's not red hot. It's, it's been cool for a while, but it has spilled off the edge of the canyon and has come down into the riverbed. Um, this is a pretty remarkable scene in Grand Canyon. Uh, you're looking at the north rim there. On the north rim, there were 102 volcanoes. On the south rim, there were two volcanoes that at the same time spewed lava over a, the, the plateaus on either side, and it spilled over down the edges of the canyon, covering up the layers of the walls of the canyon and down into the canyon gorge. And, and these lava flows built up a large lava dam that actually held back the, the river for some time. And the, the basalt lavas happened to be brittle. They, they break apart with the force of water, and eventually they gave way. And this thousand foot high dam broke apart and then the, the river or the water that was held back by it crashed through and carved out more canyon within the canyon below the dam. And what's remarkable in just floating past these lava flows, you can see the places where the, the side walls of, these, of this lava dam were broken apart. And uh, we'll, we'll, we'll talk in a moment about why that's important. Here's sort of a, a broader swath. All that big sort of triangle delta area is, is lava flow off of those plateaus. I mean, this is a massive amount of basalt lava coming off the top of the, the volcanoes at the plateau on top of the Grand Canyon, spilling down into the Grand Canyon. Um, it, it may be kind of hard to see what's going on here. These are uh, sort of cooling veins of the lava that when the lava cooled, it crystallizes into these giant hexagonal tubes uh, that are all kind of stuck together, uh, six sided long crystal things. And, and they make all these really interesting shapes on the wall. Uh, here's some of those up close. And uh, this was about a three story high wall of hexagonal cooled lava. Uh, here, here's a close up. You can see kind of the end view of those long sticks of, of cool lava. Um, I didn't show you the picture here, but we, uh, you know, we had to take sort of a, a mini porta potty with us everywhere we went as part of camp. And, um, and we parked it in between these two giant walls of lava. 
and uh, it was affectionately known as Vulcan's Throne. I won't bore you with all the details of how we survived for eight days and took care of normal business. Here is the lava flow coming down off the top. And again, that's Dr. Snelling uh, explaining uh, some pretty obvious features of this lava flow, things that should be obvious to the casual observer. Here, I give you an aerial view. So as we flew uh, out of the canyon um, back to Flagstaff, um, we, we got these really dramatic views looking back at the places we had just come through and looking up river there, you see on the left side, that's North Rim and the ground all is black. That's that lava flow up on the plateau. And you see some of these conical features of those dormant volcanic cones that spilled out all of this lava and they spewed it out and then it just flowed down into the canyon. Now, if you were to think about the process here, just as an observer, if you're going to be a detective and say, I wonder how this happened. And I'm going to give you three events and, and I want you to think about putting them in order. Okay. Just think about putting these in order. Um, lava spews out of the volcanoes. That's one event. Okay. Um, the canyon uh, gets carved catastrophically by water pouring through this area. Okay. That's another event. And then another event is the laying down of the layers that were then carved out. Oh, see, I used then. I'm already telling you which one came first. What do you think happened first? Did the layers go down? Did the canyon get carved? Or did the volcanoes erupt? What's the first event? The layers were put down. What's the third event? Trick question. The volcanoes blew up. What's in the middle? The canyon was carved. The conventional dating for these events. We talked about the top each sandstone, the lowest layer of flood sedimentary rock is dated conventionally at 500 million years. So the layers were put down at 500 million years and then younger and younger and younger. The conventional age of the Grand Canyon is 6 million years. So according to conventional geology, layers put down 500 million years ago and younger. Canyon carved out 6 million years ago either by the trickle of the little tiny Colorado River taking one grain at a time down to the Gulf of Mexico. No, it didn't happen that way. There are a lot of reasons why that didn't happen that way. We won't, we won't talk about that lesson. But, or by some catastrophic event, an inland sea breaking loose and catastrophically carving it, kind of like the, the canyons carved after Mount St. Helens erupted in 1980. Happened in a day. But it, at some point, you have to recognize the layers have to be down before you can carve the canyon. And the canyon has to be carved before you can spill lava over the walls of the canyon down into the canyon. That makes sense, right? The, the radiometric dating for these basalt lava flows off the top of the canyon. Um, this is potassium argon dated at 0.44 to 1.2 million years. So half a million years to a million years old. Um, another potassium argon dated the olivine grains inside the lava at 20 to 46 million years old. Uh, on my desk in, uh, in my office, I have, a, I have a bit of volcanic rock that has olivine grains in it. And you can come into my office and see it sometime. Uh, I got it in Hawaii and, and brought it home. And I asked some of the geologists that come through here from time to time, okay, what is this? And he said, it's basalt lava with olivine grains in it. And what's interesting is in the Grand Canyon, they've dated the, the, the green olivine grains inside the lava to be 20 to 46 million years old, while the lava itself is half a million to 1 million years old. There's something wrong with that. And then rubidium strontium age is given at 1143 million years. That is 1 billion 143 years. That is roughly the same age as the Cardenas basalt that I told you earlier was separating the flood sedimentary layers from the creation week sedimentary layers. It was that black level that got shifted down by that seismic shift that probably unleashed the inland sea that carved the canyon. 1100 million years are given for the Cardenas basalt, which is uh, below flood layers and 1143 million years are given for the basalt lavas that flowed out of the volcanoes at the top of the Grand Canyon. So roughly the same age. And they are 
hundreds of millions of years apart from each other in the geologic column. There's something wrong with the dating. And then the most remarkable one is the lead lead age given of 2.6 billion years. Okay, let's just back up for a second. Top East sandstone put down 500 million years ago. The canyon carved out 6 million years ago. And the volcanoes that blew up on the top and flowed down into the canyon blew up 2.6 billion years ago. I'm just going to say there is something wrong with your dating methods. And you should kiss radiometric dating goodbye. Uh-oh, something happened. Okay, next. I, I pushed the wrong button or something here. Nope, here we go. We got that one. Okay, uh, lesson number five. God judges sin. That is the lesson of the Grand Canyon. All these layers of rock were put down. And we might not ever have seen them had not God ran water catastrophically through the area and carved it out so that we could see all of these layers. And you have to recognize the lenses through which we look at the rocks are the critical issue. The rocks are just the rocks. They're, they're just there. But people interpret them through the lens of their worldview, through their presuppositions, what they already believe, through their anti-supernaturalistic commitments, pre-commitments. And when you and I look at the Grand Canyon through the lens of Genesis, Genesis 6 to 9, and the narrative of the flood, a 371-day event that was absolutely catastrophic on the earth, where God scoured the continent as it existed before, perhaps just one giant continent. He said the fountains of the deep burst forth, and, and probably you have the splitting up of that continent and the ushering in of rapid plate tectonics, which then splits ocean floors and exposes open seawater to hot magma that shoots superheated jet steams into the atmosphere and brings not only that deep ocean, ocean water onto the earth, in addition to the rain that was in the stored houses of clouds, um, but then you also have the, the breaking up in the continents and the aquifers that were on the continents in the rocks bursting forth. And you have this massive inundation of water. And this was not gentle. You can imagine all the seismic activity that happens there and the tsunamis, waves and waves and waves of successive tsunamis that attack coastal areas. And as the water rises and the continents are moving, the violence involved would bring a scouring of the pre-flood earth where God destroyed every living thing. Every living thing on the land, every living thing in the, in the, in the air. And totally demolished it. He scrubbed all memory of the pre-flood world because he was angry at human sin. Now, God was also merciful. Eight people in a box floated above the flood waters. And every one of us in this room is a direct descendant of those eight people saved by God's mercy. And when we look at the Grand Canyon, we are seeing layer upon layer upon layer upon layer of God's judgment against sin. We walked into Blacktail Canyon. This was a side canyon uh, off of the Colorado River. And in Blacktail Canyon, we could see in dramatic fashion what is known as the Great Unconformity. And you see uh, layers kind of going sideways in the top half of the picture. Those are sedimentary flood layers. Those are the first layers of God's judgment in the flood of Noah's age. And then below that, the sharp line, and then you got the dark rock. That is creation week rock. You're looking at rock that God made on day three. When he said, let the dry land appear. <laughs> and schists and gneists just came out. And, and it's so interesting to look at these rocks and to see how different elements in these rocks that would have been liquid magma that God brings out and cools. 
and, and all of the elements in these rocks cooling at different rates, and they would sort of squish and squeeze one another. And so you get these giant quartz veins running through this schist or the granite or the gneiss, and you get these quartz veins running through like, like when they were not quite yet solidified, still hot liquid magma and starting to cool and crystallize, being squished like in a tube of toothpaste and squished between the cracks and extruded. And you're seeing this everywhere in the Grand Canyon. We got to see so many places where we were looking at creation week rock. Fascinating. And right here is the great unconformity, which you can see on every continent of the globe, where the creation week rocks, the continents as they were before the flood, were scrubbed, sheared off in lines. And all of the rocks that had been hills and mountains in the pre-flood world uh, tumbled and ground to bits and then deposited as sedimentary layers in other parts of the world. Just fascinating to see it. Um, this is Dr. Whitmore uh, explaining he's standing his head above the great conformity uh, and the rest of him below it. And he's describing what we're seeing there in the rocks. Uh, this is a part of the Canyon where uh, we were in creation week rock, where the, the, the river had carved out below the sedimentary layers. And now we're in the, the Vishnu schist and the quartzes and the granites at the bottom of the Canyon. This is Dr. Barrick. Uh, when Dr. Barrick lectured, uh, he just had his paperback copy of the Hebrew Old Testament. And uh, just one of my heroes. And uh, he's preaching here from Isaiah 53 from the Hebrew text. And he's talking about the weight of the father's judgment as it pleased the father to crush the son. As the son carried our sins. The Lamb of God bore our sins and, and was crushed by the weight of the Father's judgment for all the sins of everyone who would ever believe. And here, Dr. Barak is standing at the great unconformity, and above him are 3,000 feet of layers of God's judgment as he's opening up Isaiah 53 and talking about God, the Father's judgment against the Lamb slain for us. We didn't say much when he was done. We walked up the canyon to the end of it in silence. And we walked back in silence. Another rafting crew beached their boat and wanted to take this scenic hike up this canyon. They hadn't heard the sermon on Isaiah 53 from the Hebrew text from Dr. Barak. They didn't know why uh, 24 men were somber and silent and thinking about their own sin and lumps in our throats but they all got quiet too. What is this? It's this sacred ground. And for us, it was. And we came back to the, the same place where we had heard the lecture and we just sang amazing grace together. Those voices echoing in the Canyon. I had to get my picture taken to the great conformity. Um, when we were driving back from the grand Canyon, eight days without showers away from our families, you know, roughing it in the, in the hot bottom of the, of the Grand Canyon and the Colorado river. Um, we're driving back on the 202 red mountain freeway and, and we drive by Camelback mountain and Dr. Whitmore says, Hey, by the way, I don't know if you knew this, but you can see the great unconformity on Camelback mountain. What? How many times have I walked past it? I didn't need to come all the way down here to Blacktail Canyon. Well, yeah, I, I wanted to anyway. But uh, maybe someday we'll take a, a hiking field trip at Camelback Mountain and to just go put our hands on creation week rock and the first layer of flood sedimentary deposit. All right, there's, there's five lessons. Um, this is uh, Lava Falls. This was one of the rapids we went th through. After I survived it, I turned my camera back up river and, and watched the other boat come through. Pretty fun. Really fun after hearing all the stories about people who died trying this kind of stuff. So, um, And then, uh, then we left the canyon and I, I, I couldn't resist just uh, talking about the exit. This was pretty fun. I'm going to pause that for a moment. I'll come back to it. Um, 
there were three helicopter pilots that were sort of ferrying our group out of the canyon up onto the rim to the place where we would catch a small aircraft flight to Flagstaff and then catch a bus back down here to Phoenix. <clears throat> and, and some of the helicopter pilots, you know, they, they'd fly over, they'd come down and, and, and they'd land, you know, at the, the little helicopter pad, which was no bigger than a, just a flat rock big enough to hold the helicopter. And people would get on board and, and they'd take off and they'd fly out over the rim. But there was one pilot that kind of stood out from the rest. Um, he, he looked like he was flying because he was having fun. And, and instead of just coming down to the landing pad, he, he would sort of hang up high. And then he would side slip the helicopter, whoosh, drop it, come out and set it down. And then when he took off, he didn't just take off and leave. He put the nose down over the people who were standing there waiting for the next ride, buzzed them, cruised right down onto the, onto the river, and then hugged the canyon walls, went up the other side, and I said, I want that guy. <laughs> and you weren't allowed to sort of arrange that. You, you couldn't make a call. Hey, can I? Um, but in the providence of God and his kindness, I think his kindness to the other passengers who would have been terrified sitting where I got to sit. I got to be in the front seat and take this video with my guy. Okay, so here it is. He did have a little Lego minifigure of himself <laughs> in the helicopter. So not enough to just leave the canyon. Let's go down on the water. And you know what? You see this debris field of rocks just sloping down. Let's just go to get a close look at that. I also said to him when I got in the, into the helicopter, I said, you know, I really like that side slip coming in. And we just started talking airplanes. Um, and I think it probably egged him on a little bit. So I was filming down towards the canyon and a pilot taps me on the shoulder and he says, hey, point the camera this way. Okay. I'm thinking, what's up? Um, he's not just going to exit the canyon. He's going to get close to this lava flow, go side over and down into the next canyon. That's just a lot of fun, you know. He's not getting out of, he's, you know, he's flying because it's fun. I should have put some dramatic music to this or something. We can sing deep and wide right now if somebody wants to lead it. So this part was really fun too. I mean, it's just flat ground. It could be really boring, but he decides, you know, he's going to fly lower than snake excrement and he's going to play dodgeball with the rocks on the ground. And we're just going to kind of weave. We're going to slalom between these piles of lava rocks just because that's fun. Again, not everybody in that helicopter enjoyed it as much as I did. All right. Well, that's the report. Thanks for enduring. I'll, uh, I'll pray and we'll be dismissed. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this evening. I thank you for the testimony that you have carved out in the rocks here in our own home state of the seriousness, seriousness with which you deal with sin. And we know the last time it was by water, next time it will be by fire. And yet you have held out in mercy. You have given time for sinners who dwell on your earth to repent and to have life in your son, the Lord Jesus Christ. God, I pray that we would not look at the rocks the same Again, uh, that, that we would uh, enjoy living where we live, but also being cognizant of the fact that all of this is evidence that water was everywhere and that you saved some by your mercy. God, we thank you for your word and its wisdom and its power. We know that the scientific world will one day catch up. In the meantime, let us embrace the foolishness of what it means to believe your word at face value. In Jesus' name. Amen.